working this with uh, one of will now be recorded. Yeah, can you yep. hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm Srikant and I'm working with one of the MNCs uh, where uh, we used to work with the retail chain. Okay. Like we do have uh, 250 plus clients, yeah. retailer clients like Kroger, Walmart, Target, like that. Okay. So uh, right now my uh, I'm a technical lead and I'm leading eight people in my team. Okay. And uh, we usually do some modeling work, but it is something like uh, what we do have is we do have uh, our own inbuilt application. We'll be doing from the we'll be building the model from our own application, and we'll be selling that particular model to the uh, vendors. That is the main thing we are working. And I I'm very much expertise in the data analytics, but however I I'm I got some knowledge on R and Python. And mm -hmm. the mostly I'm looking for something uh, I would like to well verse in this uh, retail giant where I could uh, implement all the um, like uh, all the algorithms what uh, we are trying to look like neural networks the um, decision trees how it will be implemented and what is the main purpose in where uh, the domain will be very much uh, useful for us to implement all these algorithms and fine-tune the model where we'll be giving the final model to our best fit model to our uh, end client that is main motive for me and i'm very much concerned on this retail domain how the client uh, customer acquisition is happening and customer lifetime value how the things will be calculated um, and how the segmentation of the households and demographics will be done you, you understand okay. right what i'm trying to say yeah 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 so just uh, because you are you seems to be more on the on the on the retail side and same uh does go with my profile so just i will give you a quick intro that will help you to uh i'm leading uh i'm working with one of the most uh prominent uh analytical firms in india uh that scatters mostly into the into the retail cpg sector and uh basically the terms that you're uh, you you you're uh, saying is i think uh, uh probably I'll, I'll i can connect you more with that so like in terms of uh, there are a few things on that so when when you when you talk about the modeling part yes there will be the modeling but definitely but in terms of the as you said the neural network and all because there are a few things what we are trying to uh, we try to get a mix of like if someone from other domain comes into it it's, it's just to understand more on the in depth of the customer analytics and the marketing analytics part of it so like if you talk about retail uh, operations so it also works on the same principle, right? First, you should know well on your customer side, so who they are, how they are buying, uh, their buying pattern, their behavioral segmentation, all those things will be it will be there. And second, uh, in the retail, uh, if you walk, there will be uh, the, there are a few things that we walk into it, right? The category management, because when you do a range recommendations, so there has to be a proper, a uh, deep dive on that. Right, how you recommend the range, be it in terms of running a market basket or associations, or be it looking into the category health risks and then recommending, or be it understanding uh, which categories are more appealing to which kind of customers, and thereby uh, getting an overall view, and then you recommend what should go to the stores. So there, uh, so those parts on the category management principles will also be co uh, covered. And then it, uh, in terms of uh, when we call over the pricing and the promotion, so obviously like, you know, as in the retailer, uh, they want to understand what should be my pricing policy, what kind of promotions I should run. And then it ultimately also boils down to the uh, kind of, an, uh, if I talk about um, uh, so the last part will be on the, on the campaign side of it, like how you target your customers, which target, which customers you should, you should target, how you uh, measure those events, and more on uh, more on those lines. So it, it, it will, I will show you all the overview on, on how it will things like. Uh, but yeah, definitely the uh, it will be it, it will be a good hands on on how we create the segmentations. Uh, segmentations uh, be it will definitely a loyalty will be one part of it. The second will we'll try to capture more on the behavioral segmentation. So the expectations on under in depth understanding of the customers will, will captured. Uh, then we have uh, something like uh, from the retail chain, like you know, uh, there will be cases where you have to understand uh, the propensity of a customer to buy, or more on the or, or the customer churn behavior. So these are the uh, uh, these are the aspects that we will try to capture more on the customer side of it. 
So the customer lifetime value, because uh, there are a couple of ways to do that, because I, we don't want to make it uh, very much technical in terms of the lifetime value, because where you uh, fit uh, the Poisson equations and all, but probably will give you a view what can be doable in that context. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so I have a question here. Uh, see the price and trade analytics. What you are trying to deal? Uh, you said that it is something like you will be doing it in simulation tool. What exactly it is? Because I'm going through your brochure and it is showing the simulation tool. How how do you take the? Um, uh, I I believe like uh, you will be doing some model with respect to price trade analytics. And then you will be giving the input to the Excel. Is that right? How how it will be done yeah. exactly? Because uh, yeah. normally you, uh, you will create a market mix model on that, right? So from the market mix model is basically your price elasticity model. So there you have the price elasticity. You will have, if uh, supposedly you get, uh, get a margin of a product. You know <laughs> that if I uh, if I want to optimize my margin and also play around uh, so. Because you will not be uh, even in terms of uh, the right market mix model, you do have substitute price elasticity, the cross price elasticities, and all. And then you try to fit an equation to it, right? So, basic the formation of this will be a market mix model that we will try to cover. So, which will capture your uh, seasonality, uh, which will capture more on part of the own price elasticity and also the impact how it goes on with the promotion. So, there will be an um, uh, equation on that. And post that, we are going to optimize the parameters in terms of like you will come into the Excel and try to uh, generate some simulation to see how does it perform. So the entire model you will be dealing in the Excel itself, not in R and Python for this simulation, so, right? The market, mix, market mix model will be in Python, but uh, your optimization will be uh, done in Excel. Yeah. So how do you interlink with Python and Excel then there? It will be not a real, supposedly, if you're creating a scenarios, right? So uh, uh, you get an equation from the market mix model in terms no, of I, the I think, I'm, right. I think I'm not clear. One second, please. Uh, I think I'm not clear. Uh, see, what I'm expecting is the price and trade uh, analysis. What, uh, when we tweak the price, how the uh, variables will be getting changed, like volume, sales, and percentage revenue. Yeah, you can use solver for that. Uh, so basically, the equation will be a non-linear equation, right? So in a non-linear equation, if we use a solver, so that will also give us an understanding with the changes so, of the yeah. of the yeah, the price point or the can, margin. Can we, yeah, go ahead, please. Can we give end users the simulation tool? Can we give the end users the simulation tool where they can just tweak the price and get the variables? uh change as per as per the price change can we do any such kind of scenario where i can get the um, dynamic uh, because, variables I'll tell you, because i did this because it was on my life project because i'm not sure because that was not what i think i'm, I'm going to cover more on on that part i'm going to show you definitely but uh, in terms of giving it making it more ready from the client perspective will not be the case because uh, you can understand the limitations as well as the other side so I'm going to talk about definitely on the market mix modeling. We'll take that. We'll create uh, because everyone will not have of the same level because I have to then talk of VVA and automate and those things because it will be completely run through a VVA module, the automation part of it, right? Uh, so there will be scenarios if I, if changing out the price point. So what is the impact? That definitely we will be capturing. Yeah. Okay. And what about this uh, time series analysis? Will you be covering all these things? Time series analysis. In the time series, we will be covering uh, the Arima model here. Mm -hmm. Which will be yeah. coded in Python itself, right? Python, yeah, yeah. Everything will be in Python. So, so what are the uh, algorithms you will be covering here? So let me uh, let me do one thing. Let me, uh, you know, uh, check with the list of the candidates who are there. So uh, let me take a quick intro on that. And then let's, uh, I'll, I'll definitely discuss what, what are the contents that will be, that will be covering. Sure. Perfect. Hello. Hi, Rashmi. Hi, Shreji. Yeah, I Hello, am working. You. Yeah. How you are doing? I'm good. And you? Yeah, great, great. 
yeah it's just a quick intro on your side like oh, oh, i mean what kind of profile you're working in and what your background on that so that would be great yeah actually i am a big data and spark developer and recently joined an analytics team where mainly they are working on this retail side so what they work is they create the variable creation is there then customer segmentation is there then profiling then customer 360 part they create and then finally modeling they do it on on top of it so i'm just getting involved on those things but i'm not very much clear and have a deep understanding of all those things so i want to have like a full on those things technically on python scale I, like i don't have any issue with ir python scale i have a good understanding and like coding experience on all these tools okay okay that is uh, that is perfectly fine so you worked in some segmentation exercise or something around that I am recently working on a variable creation. Like technically stuff I used to do with these guys, I help out in creating those things. But like business knowledge and all by how they are creating, like they give a variable definitions list of variables that needs to be created. I can create those, but how those variables are created, like on what basis we are creating those variables, how segmentation is done, then how they are creating a power model, a 360 power model on top of it. Then they do some profiling and then um modeling on the top of it they do it all the i know those things they are doing it but i'm not like uh, very nice quickly involved on all those and so you, what, your, your background is in good like in, in the statistics or economics or uh, engineering so engineering group i am a spark and data developer i recently joined this analytics group I'm okay. just uh, like they're leading this ETL all activities here and slowly getting involved in analytics side also. Cool, cool, right. I think uh, it's more from you to understand. I think what the intent of the course is, is like to give you a flavor of the kind of challenges uh, that we see in the retail or the e-commerce world. Uh, more from that perspective, discussing the real-time business challenges and then see how we can use uh, different approaches and with the approaches what we are going to see what we are going to learn so definitely the one part uh, will be on uh, on when we talk about uh, the, like when we talk about segmentation so segmentations also like uh, in terms there are a couple of different segmentations that can work right the first thing obviously the retailer wants to target the most loyal customers so how you create uh, the most loyal customers for you the second is more of like uh, definite. Uh, if, if you see that different world have a different like if I talk about uh, particularly if, if you see from an, uh, for the retailer we definitely do there is something called a lifestyle segmentation so it also goes with the e-commerce giant so basically what happens based on how you're buying what you're buying so they have to create those uh, homogeneous group right because someone, if you think from a perspective of uh, like who buys more into an organic products, uh, you definitely don't want to give them some offer or because they, for them, a kind of an healthy kind of an products are very important. So you don't want to provide them with something like which would be a junk kind of a food. So profiling based on those segmentations. So on the other side, like we don't have demographic data is something that we may have it might not have so that is all depend on the retailer who provides so most of the retailer apart from the us and also will not uh, traditionally in india and the asian markets you will not find those uh, rich enriched uh, demographic data that has always been a challenge so once you have a demographic data you know what while doing the profiling like this is the age band this is the, uh, this is the gender and uh, income group and also that basically makes your behavior you definitely don't use those. Uh, don't use them into, into the clustering process. Uh, but mostly from the perspective of uh, just you create based on a behavioral perspective, and while profiling you validate uh, whether like if I'm targeting the young uh, young generations or young families. So young families having uh, babies or kids. So segmentation appearing on that. Uh, this, these are called the uh, you know behavioral based segmentations which we are also going to look for. I think. The connect is basically what I can understand from you, like you, uh, new to the uh, business, and also that uh, in terms of your Python skills, is you're there, and but not much from the perspective of your the basic understanding on the on, on the retail or the or the uh, customer analytics comment, right? Yeah. 
perfect and i think with these we will uh, i don't see anyone is there hello yeah Deep, please people keep there i think he will be i think he's on mute yeah i think he's on mute right Perfect. I think I will just uh, share a, a kind of an of discuss on my screen and we're going to talk about a couple of things. So basically this is a basic slide that I'm going to have that I have, but it's more from which I can talk about what will we be covering here. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So, Srik, uh, my question for you, like since you have uh, walked into the, into the into the retail domain, so what kind of, in terms of, if I say of the, from the customer, so what are the things you're currently doing? So probably I will link it back what I have for you and uh, then we can proceed as well. Yes, based uh, based on the customer analytics, what we are going to do is we do have a few dimensions uh, for our customers, like households, where we will be dealing with the demographics of uh, demographics and the segmentation of the mosaic segmentations of, for our customers, and then mm -hmm. we do have survey dimension where we'll be getting uh, the surveys from our comp score, which is the vendor for us, and we'll be retrieving the surveys from the comp score data, and we'll try to give the sentiment analysis for them uh, by doing some uh, text mining on the on part of it which will be getting the json format we'll be converting it uh, uh, to the csv format uh, based on the python code and we'll be delivering it to our client like if you see and we'll be morely uh, calculating the contested dollars for example if you want to have the competitor sales for the albertson as well as the kroger we'll be taking mm -hmm. the store level data and We'll be projecting that particular store level data and uh, we'll be projecting more to the geography level based on the store level, right? Mm, absolutely. So uh, is, uh, is it like that you're doing some forecasting as well or is just a, because uh, the first basic understanding on the deep dive? So what do you normally no, uh, yeah. do? Some forecasting here because we do have the panel data where we will be having a, a 90 plus million data and we we need to forecast with respect to 120 million plus so we are lacking 30 million uh, households data so where we have the sample data of 90 million uh, of data and we are trying to project it to the 120 plus million uh, households data and we do okay. have a few data we'll be getting the point of sales panel data and frequent shopper sites purchase so we'll be interlinking all these databases and we'll try to project the store level data to the geography level based on all the uh, target demographics data you understand right okay so i mean that the data so when you're talking about a, a store level data do you have at a, at a product a store cross sq level yeah we'll be having the upc level data Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be having the category segment and subcategory level uh, up to UPC level right. data, and yeah. we'll be picking that particular uh, product uh, product to the uh, venue as well as time, and then we'll be calculating the opportunity sales uh, target estimated uh, uh, sorry target ACV value where we'll be uh, checking the store. Uh, store size and then we'll try to uh, give the store cluster based on the analysis distance filter okay okay got it and uh, anything on a behavioral segmentation on a customer that you always do yeah see the demographic data what we are trying to do is we have uh, 72 segmentations in our uh, uh, hh demographic dimension where we'll be yeah. trying to uh, do the segmentation as per the as you said like we are trying to pick the homo homogeneous groups because i haven't done this one because i, I do have basic knowledge on how it has been done but i, I okay. came here to know how the things will be done yeah. uh, because before getting into this project uh, I, everything has been done but uh, as per my understanding, I have gone to the KT something and I, I came to know how this has been done. Where the out-of-stock analysis will be done from our end 
and i would like to know how the out of stock analysis will be done also it will be great if i get that hands on experience uh, yeah out of stock I'll, I'll quickly tell you because out of stock is something that we uh, we work as uh, something uh, based on a projected time that we say uh, this was the expected sales but uh, because everything also you cannot uh, put here so i think uh, we have not put uh, the availability issue uh, in the in this project scope uh, because we are going to work with the limited data here so but uh, for uh, doing this kind of exercise it's more of like you need a either there is a forecasting um, at a store cross your category level so normally we do uh, in the real time projects we try to forecast if this is the expected number of volume that should have so but it doesn't because currently uh, the uh, the better way of doing is always that if you could take care of your uh, the associated categories because anyways your demand of a product will always depend on how your associated categories and your substitutes are performing whether you are running any promotions or not because that is also a part of like uh, it's basically when you talk about availability or out of stock issues so it's basically you wanted to uh, predict beforehand like this is the amount or this is the quantity that it should have for this category in the store at this given point of time right so that needs a lot bit of complications to add on definitely will touch base that part but that is not in the current scope right now okay yeah uh, so anything on that you have did it for like a, a kind of an predictive models that current ongoing projects on in this yeah i do have uh, sufficient knowledge on neural network decision trees uh, linear, uh, linear uh, and logistic regression also and moreover okay. uh, i would like to know more how the variables will be segregated for example the principal component analysis and factor analysis you will be choosing right so in that area i know how the things will be done but I really uh, literally speaking i am not sure how the variables will be minimized and uh, i would like to know more on that because the eigen vectors the eigen values concepts i know but uh, real time scenario i would like to know on those yeah definitely i will tell you quick uh, bit on that because uh, have you written anything on your uh, uh, recommendation engine or something that you have done recommendation engine uh, i didn't get you how it can be done uh, recommendation is basically uh, the way youtube or netflix they give the recommendation to the customer so this is called the factorization right so either you can uh, there is a technique called collaborative filtering for that so collaborative mm -hmm. filtering i'm not aware okay perfect so there are like on the factorization that you mentioned so there are uh, two or three ways that we'll try to gauge so one uh, supposedly think of the associated set of categories the customers are buying into so suppose uh, i'm so, uh, say uh, someone who's uh, who having a child or baby they will be they will be buying into uh, baby care accessories so be it in terms of uh, the talcum powder the baby diapers the powder milk or the uh, baby clothing so all these things based on an associated score if you run even a factor that is going to group those set of categories and fall them under one bucket so when you do any kind of a behavioral segmentation so behavioral segmentation i mean that based on the what kind of products a customer is buying so you want to group them in a homogeneous group so that means that based on all the subcategories and the categories information you have so it's probably because if you if you talk about a, a overview, overview of a like the higher level like if you business division then categories and subcategory subcategory those side of information so you will see that your baby set of categories so they my baby clothing will lie down to apparel baby food will lie down to the groceries uh, whereas there can be a baby milk or something that can be more of a fresh item right so there will be different product hierarchies that these subclasses can map into it but while a customer sees they see that this is a one need for me so how factor analysis is going to help you to classify or group those similar needs together that is something that we are going to look into it so grouping those similar needs how those customer perceives and buys so that will be coming under one buckets or major themes 
that is something that we are going to achieve using the factor analysis and at the top of it using those factor uh, factors that we derive we are going to run the cluster analysis to create the segmentation so neural network and also because the uh, 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 to be very clear that we don't have in the scope it's more of uh, just getting an overview of how this customer and the marketing world that will be uh, that will uh, that there so in terms of the segmentation uh, so let me uh, uh, so i'm going to touch base uh, this slides and also going to uh, tell what are the things that we are going to cover so uh, you also are uh, you are uh, familiar with association analysis uh, right market basket yeah i i know what is uh, happening in that but uh, real time scenario I, i did not do on r and python and uh, i have i have told like a principal component analysis how this can be done uh, i need to minimize the um, set of variables and make it to uh, fewer which are very much significant is this can be done in our sec, uh, course yes that will be covered so it's basically grouping of the factors right so we are going to, what we are going to do if you have entire things so how you how you run a factor analysis and you are basically from the set of say uh, say 80 or 100 features how you bring it down to 15 or 20 features that is what we are going to discuss on the factor analysis okay yeah uh just uh, talking brief on uh, on on a content on this is not exactly the, the syllabus that we're going to talk but i'm just giving you a basic overview and also going to show you the what kind of data that we are going to work on um It's important for us in the real time world to understand the customer buying needs. So it's always uh, targeting the right customers to the right channel, and in terms of the right frequency is also what we talk about. That if you uh, you know start giving too many offers to a customer, that is also not, not the right thing because by doing the same, you are incurring your marketing cost, but you are not getting a high return on investment on that. So understanding those, what should be the frequency, what should be the right time and content so content we are not going to talk about but the frequency is something that we are also not going to touch base much but it's only because our frequency is basically based on a customer lifetime value and things so you should, you try to understand how many times we need to contact contact the customers so the basic overview what is going to help us is uh in depth understanding of the customers so in depth understanding of the customers is more on the perspective of uh because once we know the customer uh, lo uh, loyalty the customer loyalty is more of like uh, we say uh, this is something that we uh, do with an rfm approach rfm is basically your recency frequency and monetary right so you try to see how frequently how recently and what is the value addition that a customer is doing to the business based on that you try to create a segmentation so this segment is always so if you classify in, uh, normally they tend you know, like 20% of the customers give 80% of the sales that doesn't happen but it's more of the perspective what i've seen traditionally because i worked uh, with tesco i worked with uh, 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 with some of the asian markets like tesco lotus uh, this is basically from the thailand perspective i also work with some of the retailers uh, that is from the us and currently working uh, with the with the latin america retailers like from the colombia mexico and brazil so traditionally uh, seen that around 18 to 19% of your customers do contribute to around 55 to uh, 58% of your sales this is traditionally what i have seen and now you have to decide a window so while in a retail world and uh, because you have to understand so if i have to target or if i have to define a customer loyalty then what is the window that i need to check so that depends like if i take a years data and see how many of the customers are returning uh, in like average return per week like if i see that if it's around 7 or 8 weeks my most of my customer in terms in terms of 75% of the customers do return back that will allow me to uh, fix a window so normally i think it's it can be uh, in the in a particularly when you talk about a grocery worlds uh, their 8 weeks or 13 weeks window do work so it all depends like uh, now how many customers are coming under the windows and also that that decides the loyalty factor the next part on it is like uh, once we uh, identify the loyal group of customers so it's always important for us to 
uh, to have the right value offerings for them. So then you have to understand what are the categories. So what what are the key drivers for a customer to uh, to come into the store, uh, uh, keeping in view of loyal customers uh, here. So we are going to touch base the customer loyalty here. The second part of like you know reducing campaign costs. So basically, uh, often you you will see that uh, the the start. The retailer they have some uh, they have some like the volume counts like I want to target 50k customers for this and blah blah right. But if you have a better identified customer group, supposedly someone or uh, particularly we see that Coke or Pepsi they are running some offers or Unilever running some offers, they will have some categories on that right. So then you have to identify the right right group of customers whom you can uh, send the coupons, send the offers and who will have the high probability or high, uh, high probability of redeeming the, the offers. So typically, if it's not that a predictive model, but also based on the segmentation and how you're creating, you can also classify the group. So the one part of it, like you can create a predictive model and then, uh, then uh, see your customer audience. The second part also like when I create a segmentation based on behavior and other loyalty and all those things we are talking about. So that is also going to give you a view like, okay, this is the group of customers that can be targeted. The decrease in attrition by accurately predicting customers. So it's obviously like, uh, we know like uh, predictive customers uh, will always help you to uh, optimize your marketing budget and uh, reaching out to the right customers. This is more important from the uh, campaign or targeting customers over here. So. In terms of the second part, when you're talking about a most valuable customers, your yeah, loyalty will cover that. Uh, the second part will be what encourages someone to become a customer. So definitely, as you were mentioning on in-store behavior. So what it happens like typically we see the loyal journey. So when a customer was not loyal, say opportunity kind of in group and then they're slowly becoming a loyal. So you try to understand their behavior and how what it makes them to be loyal so definitely that can be my drivers and which we should encourage in terms of uh, doing more of that stuff in, in 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 the store and also like because whatever the strategies or action you're going to take that is finally going to translate either into customers or either into stores so when we talked about pricing when we talked about uh the like if you if you walk into a retailer the typical question that we always uh, see that how i should position my categories what kind of uh, products or categories i should have in my store right so these are always been those questions that uh, we have uh, seen or uh, typically coming from the retailer targeting obviously so whenever they want to do some relevant promotions or uh, specific to the customer would then the questions on on on, on uh, you know on your uh, segmentation or predictive part of it but also your segmentation leads to your store designs so what i'm talking about um, when you when you see different geographies right be it in india as an example you will see that there are variation in customers there are variation in in terms of their buying pattern, their needs, uh, their economical responses, uh, the location of the stores, because all these things will will finally translate like what kind of range I should have in my store. Probably uh, uh, the uh, Rashmi, so which location you belong from? Uh, you? It's Maharaj. Maharaj, yeah. okay. We can't hear. Uh, Shri Kanthi, you there? Yes, uh, I didn't get your question. Uh, so, which part of India you belong from? I am from Hyderabad. Okay, cool. So, typically, when you see that you know the behavior in Mumbai or typically in Hyderabad versus Delhi. There will be specific uh, differences, and also if you move to other tourist or industrial area, there will be different requirement. But if you move in, into more of an urban, that will be a different requirement. So ultimately, it translates down. So what kind of uh, renders that I should have in the store? 
So for that, what you need to do is like if I created a kind of a behavioral segmentation, I know in this particular part of or in this kind of stores, I have more of price sensitive like the customers who are who always uh, going to buy for the cheap products uh, are going to come to it, right? So there, my pricing policy should always I have to be very competitive and also I have to uh, I have to keep the ranges that will be more of a regular needs right there. I don't need very highly premium kind of a product getting placed. So my uh, main concern will be the immediate requirements. So there can be cases like a few of the stores which may be uh, located in the locality of like if you talk about uh, you have neighborhoods around. So, but not look at it into the official uh, like uh, locations. So there, the mainly the requirements will be how you can have the regular like the fresh and the dairy products, right? In the morning, everyone will try to go the go for their immediate breakfast, the milk, uh, the fresh food or fruit, or fruits or the vegetable items. So those will be your key focus. So obviously, the in-store range recommendation depends based on the buying pattern of the customers that you that you see around. So that is the one part we have seen. The second is like uh, if you go to a, a retail store, you will see there for particularly if I take an example of a cold beverage, right? So you have Coke, you have Pepsi, your Seven Up, Mirinda, and every of these suppliers we call, uh, they will have different pack sizes. They will have a different uh, pack sizes along with the flavors, right? So now it can have like I got 50 different UPCs in a category, but all this 50 different UPCs which you are placing in your shelf, that doesn't give you the enough ROI because of the fact these excuse, every of these excuse is not appealing to the customers, right? So in terms of you need to understand you need variety. Definitely we talked about having the right uh bread before depth always that is a principle so whenever we do position our uh, products into the store there is always an important message that it says cover your bread before the depth so i have multiple needs of the customers that 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 should be present and in terms of the depth it's called about like how much quantity or how much pack sizes or those things that is something that uh that can be uh that can be your second priority so Understanding, so you may not. There can be. There is something called a range rationalization. So what is the range rationalization? Typically, it does like it tries to from the set of hundred or say if you if you properly do a category review and you do at a product code level or an UPC level, you try to understand what is the sales coverage from the customers. So how the customers are buying into it and basically. Uh, there is something called a concept called need state. So we do uh, because that is typically uh, a kind of the product that we have in our organization. So once supposedly you're running a cold beverage as a category. So what is going to happen? So all the needs, like even the substitutes. So if you are buying Coke 1.2 uh, liter, Pepsi 1.2 liter is your immediate substitute, right? And both of them have a flavor of cola. So there is highly unlikely that a customer buying Pepsi 1.2 liter is also also going to buy up Coke 1.2 liter unless if someone is a trader or a bulk buyer, right? They come, uh, they, they they sell it to the uh, in their uh, in their uh, local stores. So then this is called a trade or bulk buying. TV. They're going to stock for more, so they will they, they will have the right mix. But normal people will definitely not uh, buy these two or three products. So you buy. So there is some algorithm that we put into it. We try to identify this group of uh, needs, and then at the top of it, what we do is uh, we try to gauge how much, what is the percentage of sales that you are capturing from every of the needs, so that you can propose back to the retailer from if like if you have 50 SKUs, we propose to have 40 SKUs into your store. So this is something we try to do, and this is called delisting of UPCs or SKUs in terms of optimizing. So, are you talking about the product uh, similar product attribute similarity in this case? Yes. 
So, uh, will you will you be dealing the K-means clustering in this one, or how do you deal for this product that works in there? K-means clustering, we'll definitely do it for segmentation of customers. But from the products, you cannot uh, we cannot run the K-means clustering here because it's more on substitutability logic. So, uh, so how how you will be approaching for the product attribute similarity in this case? Because I, as you said that uh, uh, it is something related to out of stock, right? Uh, when, whenever the shopper enters into the retail j retail market, definitely if he doesn't have the Coke, he he might have uh, chosen uh, the based on the same attributes. He might have picked Pepsi like that. So I would like to showcase. Uh, uh, I, I I don't want to churn my customer out of my retail, uh, so I would like to place the same similar attributes uh, into my shelf where uh, mm -hmm. we can so have the sales for that. To, yeah, we are, to, uh, we are not going to do it at a SQ level. So we are go run, going to run the association analysis at a category level. So the grouping of categories together will be a part of it, not grouping of products. So grouping of products typically are based on your substitute logic that we create. No, I didn't get you. Could you please come again? Yeah. Uh, so supposedly when you run a market, typically a market basket, I think I have got a slide on that. Yeah, so it will be basically we are going to look into the, the associated categories here. So supposedly if your milk and bread, they're coming together. So we are going to talk of that. So how you group similar categories together and place in one like your should place them into in, in the uh, in the same shelf so that customer can find the relevant categories together. So this is based on your support, confidence and lift that we are going to talk about. But the, if you're saying that uh, how we are going to do the Coke 1.2 liter and Pepsi 1.2 liter, this is just an example I'm saying because this UPC level uh, there you cannot run K-means clustering because one customer, because if you see from that perspective, a customer who's buying into uh, Pepsi 1.2 liter will not definitely buy Coke 1.2 liter, right? Then you cannot group those customers because for K-means clustering, you always need that similar customers because if you run a k-means clustering on the top of it supposedly based on sq that i take of a category because it will be n number of sq so let's limit down to say a one category say cold beverage right so there you might be having 50 upcs and you are getting a score of a customer to buy into that but what it will this clustering exercise will do is not going to group you the product of the like someone who buys into coke 1.2 liter uh, buying mirinda there can be multiple things so that will get clubbed together so that will definitely no i i'm no I'm, I'm trying to do the based on the attribute level for example flavor sense under carbonated beverages if you take right uh, mm -hmm. and i'm trying to do the retail pack uh, self pack such kind of thing the attributes what we have whether it is Definitely, uh, because attributes, I think Definitely, we don't have, yeah. our, uh, have in the, uh, because we, we don't have the data on that, the enriched data. Whether we so, have nutrition facts, yeah, because fact, fact, fact. Yeah. So if you have like something like brand cross pack size and those bit of things, so definitely that will, that can be done. So what we, because the main, yeah. can, uh, the intent of the course is just for them who are want to get into this customer marketing analytics. So what are the immediate things that they need to look into it and just to make them more comfortable into this because you know, adding too many layers uh, would also make it a bit uh, conflicting right now. So because I have to touch base the mathematical component to some extent and also then uh, move on with the, with the coding part and applications. So that attribute data we don't have, but uh, 
even I will check because there are something that we can take it offline if it, if, if it has, but uh, not uh, in the due state of the course. Cool, right? So, next we talk about more on the uh, customer uh, because based on the loyalty segmentation, uh, what we have created here, if we go down, it's more of like understanding the like this will be more on the customer segmentation and followed by the acquisition of customers how you want to acquire your customers like those who are not buying into your category but how you uh, how we will target them to buy into that so there will be our cross sell and upsell propositions and then we are going to talk about a customer loyalty or because that is always a uh, customer churn is one of the main concern points so creating a predictive model here we are going to run with a logistic regression model in Python and we are going to touch base on the different concepts of the logistics model. Uh, Rashmi, you did, uh, you, do you have any knowledge on the predictive or logistics model or something like that? Yeah. We can't have, but I just want to check like if you. Hello? Yeah, is this question for me? Uh, no, as is for Rashmi, I think you are you already aware of the logistic regression, right? Freekant. Correct. Uh, during the customer churn, churn analysis, we'll be uh, dealing like the output variables, whether he will be churn or not. On the exactly, time. yeah. So we are going to talk about a bit of the cost, cost function, how you optimize, uh, uh, how we create a model, model the cross validations, or not everything on Python. So we are not, but the main thing will be a logistic regression provided if we get some time because it, so we have this is not typically a case of ML. So have, we have not uh, you know designed the codes email application into the into the retail or customer or marketing world but it's more of us how using python how we will produce this while doing that we're going to talk of definitely the domain will be in logic but i'm going to touch base also the decision tree uh, so basically a basic understanding how it can be done using an exeboost or um, basically exeboost or basically random for us so you will touch base a bit on the concepts on that we'll spend some time as well on that yeah but that is a, not the intent of your like Put all the ML algorithms together. Uh, Rashmi, for you, the question is like, have you done anything on the predictive model? Like, any idea on that? No, no. No, perfect. So, we are going to go a bit on that because we're going to go in depth on that how we create the, what is the predictive model, how we do that. So, basic things on that. So, so we cover all in detail because the main intent was uh, that as stuff like knowing that someone doesn't know on the predictive model. So we'll try to design more on that. Customer lifetime value is something that we don't have. We have not kept it in the scope. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say how, why it's important. I'll give you a flavor of that. But here, there is one or two ways to do it. The one part will be a very uh, kind of a simplistic way of doing, but in terms of um, how you predict values of a customer in the next two or three years, that is something that uh that that can be doable in a very in a in a simpler way but the main part of it is it's, it's a very technical where you put a bayesian kind of a thing so that will make the process more complicated so currently we have not kept this part in the scope so yeah so now yeah, more the, of like the, yeah yeah for the churn management what are the important variables you are uh, picking in this it will be based on all the buying behaviors, like uh, how frequently, frequently the customers are coming into the store, what categories they were buying into it, uh, what is the interpurchase frequency between different time frames. Like uh, for every month, you will try like for uh, in two months and three months. Uh, so if the duration of their uh, like visit between the two time frame is increasing, the, if the spend pattern is going down, uh, if the average number of categories they were buying if that is uh, that is uh, uh, you know that is shrinking uh, then definitely for the major uh, categories or the broader categories of sub, not at the subcategory level definitely but categories level if the spend is declining over the time so that will give us a kind of a driver like there are two things like the one on the churn part is like uh, what are the drivers for churn the second part is who's going to churn so in the drivers we do capture like uh, whether someone is moving out into some categories that's leading to churn on the other side like to identify the right churn group so we will mostly playing with the uh, the frequency the recency part of it and with the some category buying behavior yeah 
okay these are all the direct drivers or uh, these are the derived drivers it will be derived so we will not because uh, i'll show you the data that we have and based on that we have to derive things and do things because it will be beat segmentation that we are creating and these are all will be the inputs that we will be passing into the predictive model so even the factors even the clusters that we are talking about we got we will be initial first we are going to do that next that all the attributes will be passed on into our model any question on that thanks sir no thanks sir yeah. perfect uh, so basically uh, from the uh, customer value perspective uh, it was a basic things i have not uh, you know try it as much as i could because this will be not all the things that we will be the lifetime values on there so from the segmentation so now if i uh, go on the techniques and uh, and how we are going to proceed the first thing that we are going to understand is uh, the definitely we'll call a business health check or a performance uh, driver right we'll start with the basic kpis on understanding uh the first part of the course is more on spending time on how you understand the main kpis of a retail like supposedly if i talk about the epos like post transactions or the extent per visit the number of visit a customer doing if i translate to the a customers having a loyalty card for them important is the you know uh, the total sales is further uh, derived into the sales the spare the number of customers the spend per customer then it the spend per visit uh and then the frequency of the purchase so all these things are will be a kpi right so when we talk about uh the a kind of a deep dive to any retailer so the initial understanding is how we framework that at the first level we have to talk about how the overall uh, what are the overall kpis then we will translate down to how we get a meaningful insights be it in geography be it in cat category level where and when what is declining what is the quantum of that so this are the health check that always uh, helps our retailer to understand uh, from the perspective of where we are going wrong and and when we are going right even and what are those drivers where we need to consider it whether if my customers are shrinking in some category or whether my customers are not spending in overall retail versus overall category so all those things will be the first checkpoints that we are going to discuss in the uh how we formulate the you know, like our retail or health check or a cuff order an overall health check uh, specifically with respect to the retail or any of the uh, e-commerce kind of and domain mm. the second part will be because there will be few things i think if you are uh, hands on on the python so what we will expect is like we are going to give you some set of the data sets so where you can the operations like the joining the sorting the bundles kind of an exploratory so that is something that we have that uh, i mean that you can try out on the data so we will spend understanding the data what we have then bit on more into like uh, doing the simpler things in terms of merging the data sorting the data uh, then creating some functions out of it right so everything on on a python base and um, next from there we are going to move bit on the statistical procedures like how we understand the uh, basic statistical concepts of like the mean median mode and those uh, um, uh, stuff is also going to get discussed like if we do it or not describe so definitely all the statistical measures is going to come and what we how we define a variance and covariance how does it translate because often the questions and understanding uh, the simpler things like we are like during the interview also we i asked like how you with if you don't have anything in your data so how using a correlation or covariance even you're going to understand the solution can be clusterable or not so those on this perspective is also uh, because we are going to be on the touch base uh, more on that and then we are going to move into the into the first part will be on the loyalty segmentation so if you to talk about typically a loyalty segmentation it will look something like this so we knew the active and active uh, customers we see the loyalty customers uh, so there are two uh, two ways of doing it it is like i am the way uh, like if you all guys can uh, we'll talk about the basic idea we'll have the data sets then basically let's make it more interactive in the session 
So the first part definitely we're going to talk over the concept and then it's more of like for your Python, uh, you know, Python expert as I will see that if you have to do the same, how will you do it? So I'll pass on the balls uh, at your code so that you also try it first, then I do it at my end. So we'll make it uh, more of uh, more of interactive uh, in that context. So this is how we are going to typically do the loyalty uh, segmentation here. And from the loyalty segmentation, then we are going to talk about the factor and uh, like the one that I was talking about a behavioral segmentation. So behavioral segmentation typically works in uh, in this framework. So where like if you because if you have a uh, like profiling data in terms of the gender in terms of the age which are which are nothing but your uh, demographic data this all can be used during the uh, uh at a profiling stage but it typically when we talk of, of any of the retailer data we all like uh, behavioral data we talk about like with the kind of the products they are uh, they are they are buying into it supposedly when we talk about this particular segment the marriage profession uh, professional right so child education buying first home increase in insurance so these are the typical things but you definitely from retail data doesn't translate but it's more of like if someone is buying into the baby diaper baby clothing and those kind of needs will definitely come under the uh, married professional things so emptiness is typically they buy into the you'll see the groceries and daily needs they will be buying into that but not buying into the uh, child care needs so for an early uh, early like uh, uh, the kind of a couple if you talk about the, uh, the, the I think married professionals or professionals with or uh, not a professional word uh, so basically young family having kids so they will start having more of categories so there was some key study that we had to do uh, where they wanted to target specifically some segments. It has been seen from research like a customer, uh, basically those who get into early into the marriage, they need to buy a lot for their, uh, to, lot for the to settle, and then their needs keep on increasing. So always it's important to target this group because if you could, uh, if you could retain this group uh, in your business, they are going to do a lot many value additions because all this baby care and the child care and these uh, needs are because these products are actually have high margin. So in terms of overall profitability of the retailer, uh, these segments uh, are something that always they, uh, you know, the retailer aims to try for. So this will be a product in this segmentation that we are going to do. So here, as we discussed, like we're going to run a factored analysis or a collaborative filtering. So the recommendation engine can also work into it. And then what we are going to do is using those attributes that we have created, we are going to run a k-means clustering. So for clustering, uh, for you, Reshmi, is like a clustering is a technique uh, which helps you to, you know, uh, to group the customers with this similar buying pattern. So there are, uh, this is typically in case the, uh, if you say this, uh, the, the, this big data world, we say like one is a supervised learning and the unsupervised learning, right? So supervised learning is something where you know there is an outcome. So typically when we talk about any of the predictive models, I know either the event has happened or not happened, which has been classified either as one or zero, right? So that will be something uh, uh, because for clustering exercise or behavioral segmentation, we don't know because everything that we are gauging based on the data. So that's why these are called uh, unsupervised learning techniques. Uh, here we are going to run through the clustering as one of the process. So in the clustering, even we have two or three things. One is called a k-means clustering. So k-means clustering is basically so at a randomly you will allocate some cluster value like i want six or seven eight clusters it's going to run for you as going to give you the outcome and then you have to validate again like you can run it like four five six seven eight this you can specify this number of clusters and you can run and definitely there is a statistical component to it which understands uh this is giving me the best uh cluster or best feed so we have those uh, techniques that goes into it and then we are going to identify uh, 
identify the, the, the optimal number of clusters and from the segmentation we will do the profiling so these are all will be the profiling part of it where you're going to typically see uh, the demographics what how much they're spending uh, which categories they are buying at what time they are buying into it so your your basically your presentations looks like more from that angle knowing the segmentation uh, starting from the kpi uh, then uh, looking on down to, or creating some indexes on the categories they are buying and what time and what matters to them. So all those bits that comes under a behavioral segmentation. Uh, so this will be the clustering exercise. So we'll start with the health check. We'll do the factor analysis, then come down to the customer in terms of a uh, K-means clustering, which will will finally uh, roll it down into uh, uh, because the next part of it is your the predictive model. So here we are going to use those things to identify whether a driver to churn. So like if I know my customers now well in terms of their loyalty, in terms of the behavior, it's now it's important to know if this group of customers is going to churn or not. So retaining customer retention comes into the picture. So we are going to create the, the model. So we are going to do a predictive model also. Now in a predictive model, so this is a supervised learning technique. Why? Because you know from an historical data, you have to predict if a customer is going to uh, leave or in some time, right? This is something we need to predict. So already based on my historical data, I know I have to select my customer universe. Uh, say I select my customer universe, uh, universe based on a one year uh, and from the one year when we move on to the next 13 weeks, uh, the customer have not, uh, uh, you know, they have left. So we'll take a one year window. In a one year, we have taken customers, those who had more or less frequently visited. And in the next one quarter or two quarter, they are not coming into your store. So you are losing your customers. So in that context, this will allow us to create the event. And we know we, uh, we know from our past data, this has already happened. And from taking that into account, you have to predict uh, whether the customers will uh, will going to churn or not in the near future, right? So in that context, uh, there are different modeling techniques. Initial, uh, when it started, we when we used to run things on SaaS was the environment. Now, as we moved into open sources like R and Python, there was a, there was a framework that was called logistic regression that has been coming over the ages and been uh, you know the best to uh, best in the class as well. But now with more uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, so the, our scope will be on the logistic regression understanding. So once you create this, uh, uh, create a model, the important is like how you derive your features. So as uh, Srikanth was telling, like how are you going to get the feature engineering? These are called the feature engineering, where you have to, it is not only the straight set of variables you're plugging in, but you have to create a derived set of features to understand these patterns uh, uh, and then you you put it as a framework. So supposedly you, you start with an 80 or 90 variables. You identify, okay, this can churn. Then finally you have to fine tune and uh, select probably the, uh, the important 2025 features that are important for customers to churn. So here the intent will be, uh, we'll spend more of time in the predictive model to understand what are the key component, the theoretical part of it like how we uh, there are steps to do it like uh, so how we understand correlation covariance between the uh, variables how we understand the information value of the variable so information value is nothing but the ability of the variable to classify between a good and bad so there will be those statistical uh, your know, terms that we are going to discuss and also finally it's going to translate back to your model so now from there how we are creating those uh, features part and then how we uh, do a model uh, because now once you're creating them in the part of the model then we need to understand evaluate your model and your there is something called a model test and validation so based on there will be some parameters which will allow us to tell with multiple iterations if you're doing so this is what it's, it's basically the optimal value of the model where your performance is good and now there can be cases what is validation typically that maybe out of the entire data sets 70 percent of the data sets you have used 
30 percent you have used for your testing purpose right so with the 70 percent of the data you derived to some conclusions these are the variables that are important these are the group of customers that are going to churn but while you run them in a test data set so then it might happen your results or performance that you got in your uh, while creating the model and now with your test data sets they differ it means that there had been some issues or it was not homogeneous so there are some techniques that also touch bases to tell if my model is good enough and stable over a period of time so also we need to check our model uh, supposedly i have created a model based on one time window then again i have to go with an another time window and uh, with the same uh, because now if you taste because once you got uh, created your model you will have some uh, kind of an uh, the features value right so ultimately uh, your all the equations will be set based on what you have got now you are going to use the same set of equations say just i'm using the word equations here because because since you're not familiar with the you know logistics part of it so just i'm using the word equations so all those equations now is going to get fit into it and you are going to run with a different time frame so proceeding time frame and this is called out of time validation now you are going to see that okay if i'm also moving to the like proceeding with the next another six months my model results is have not deteriorated that means that is stable so th this is some of the stability checks that we also do so once we are done with the predictive part of it so during the deep dive uh, because you are also going to spend more time on the identifying the root cause like how my categories are performing which geographies are performing good where the main concern lies because always typically if you walk into any other retail house uh, this will be the questions predominantly coming so where i am losing my business so once you run with the category part of it probably uh, we are going to run the market by like association so the one that to talk about the association analysis uh rashmi for you is like uh, supposedly if you go to a store and you see that there are some typically some products that uh, need to be kept together right if you if you go to in the morning you need bread you need uh, butter you need jam and those set of products which comes under as a breakfast needs uh, so typically to be kept uh, together here so if you see from the perspective uh, uh, this is called a market basket analysis so in the market basket analysis so what as it be it kind of and products that are uh, sold together you can create some combination of it so if you see that often retail is the kind of an offer that you give is like if you buy rice if you buy oil uh, sugar all this uh, thing if you buy a bunch of that you get this amount of free or they create some combination offer so this is what it means as a part of an like an uh, how you typically design a combination offer organize and place associated products and categories nearby in so what happens is like if a customer if you if you go into walk into a store and um, if you see that you are buying potato and you are not uh, getting an onion nearby or a tomato nearby then it's basically you have to travel here and there that is going to lead confusion and you are not going to find out the right product at the right place so this is more from the inventory perspective so like if you under if you can keep all the products which have like uh, all the categories rather i will use the word like which are getting sold together together uh, so adjacent to uh, uh, adjacent uh, places then basically it's it it is a uh, in terms of your shopping experience uh you don't have to uh, look here and there that is uh, that is what it drives also the customer satisfaction because whenever we did some customer survey uh, it also do came in that uh, for like i have to go and buy detergent and one place but i have to go and get uh, my you know the uh, kit uh, kitchen uh, it's called uh, the vim liquid and uh, stuff right so the kitchen uh, accessories in other place so that is not the right experience for me so all those bits you will see coming together so this is what the technique we are going to use so probably we are going to touch base the market uh, market basket uh, uh, then and there then we are going to move so Surajit, once can we... i pass you hello yes Surajit, can i pass you for uh, for a minute
Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so how do you describe this market uh, basket analysis and cross sell? Uh, do you have any difference in between those? No, cross sell and uh, typically cross sell it happens at a customer level, right? So once you understand the associated categories, the, probably what you do is like a customer who's buying into uh, uh, into one part of it, but uh, not buying the, uh, the another part which is highly associated. So that is what uh, your association is about. The cross selling will do come from there. So typically in a collaborative filtering technique that I'm talking about the recommendation engine, you will see that um, that is also because association and uh, the recommendation engine, they are uh, very close by. But the technique bit will be a bit different, but underlying objective will always be the same. Here you do it at an overall basket level to understand like which are the categories that can be sold together, but it finally translate uh, to a customer level, uh, while you run a recommendation engine, it's going to tell if someone, uh, if a customer is buying P1, P2, he should buy P3. So that is what you do in recommendation engine. So recommendation is also a cross sell model for you. So you mean to say the association relates to the market basket analysis and the recommendation for cross sell? Yeah. So one part like oh, from the market basket, you are you know that, you know, uh, if someone is buying shampoo conditioner is an associated category, but someone who's like, you know, that someone buying shampoo, but not buying conditioner, right? That is one way of doing a cross sell. But what does recommendation engine does is going to have customers and you know that uh, like customers will be your rows and all these set of categories will be your columns, right? And you are going to have some score out of it. Like if I have visited 10 times, two times I've got shampoo, one time I've got conditioner, uh, soap I've got for two times. So you'll get a score out of that. Now it's going to break down into two lower order metrics. This is called a high level matrix, or uh, basically a matrix uh, that is based on your customer and category scores. Now you are going to create two low order matrix. One is called a user matrix and one is called a product matrix. The user metrics are typically those metrics where you have the customers, their propensity to buy into the products. So that is something that you're going to have. The second part of the product universe that I'm talking about, they're going to group the similar P1, P2, P3. So this is done by factor analysis, the behind technique that is called a non-negative matrix factorization. So in terms of the technicality, if you uh, if you talk about uh, collaborative filtering. Also, there's a, like if you uh, there's a, another way of doing that is called a cosine similarity. So because typically for market basket, it does it like at a basket level, it's, it's more of the probability, but we run a, a factor analysis to get a recommendation engine uh, and also that can be used for a cross selling. So cross selling either can be drawn to the market basket or if we want a more customized version of it, then we do it using a recommendation engine. Okay, something like it is uh, relates to buyer pattern, right? Cross selling. Yes, absolutely. Cool. So this will be more on like when we talk about this association here, and next we will look uh, move into something like once we have. Completed. These are basically the uh, the know-how that we need to on on the customer side of it. Uh, then we move into uh, uh, into the marketing uh, side of it. So where we are typically going to talk about uh, marketing mix models. So uh, just a sec. So where we have uh, you can see my I've just switched on to the second presentation. Can you uh, can you see it? Yeah, right. drives it. Yes. So basically, uh, typically in the typically when you uh, when you look into the um, supposedly, let me give you an example here. Why we need a marketing marketing mix kind of a thing. I am spending uh, because this is uh, because we will not have that exact data that we are going to work, but I'm tr I'm trying to get up proxy kind of a data so probably will have captured this set of information to 
typically uh, when we beat in e-commerce or with the in-store there have to be a like you run different campaign with different things together right so you need to understand what are those factors uh you know in terms of where i should have my investment so it's more of an investment optimization part of it so i may be giving an ad in newspaper the typically example typical example i'm talking of the application here but uh, we are going to limit down to few things here because this data is very difficult to get into it and and some of the companies uh, do work typically those who work on the media side of it so media side i means that they design like this is uh, this is what you need to the amount that you should ideally spend on your promotions and promotions means like supposedly uh, the four piece of marketing uh, the four piece of marketing in terms of product uh, place price promotion people so these are the the five p's rather that is very important from the marketing perspective right now when we get into the promotions so basically Basically, until or unless you have a, you're communicating like you may be having a best of the product, but you are not reaching out to the customers. You are not giving some kind of communication to them by which they will be aware of the product or the offering. Even even you are saying that you are giving X percent off, right? So you have to send that communication. In order to send that communication. either we are going to uh, do a tv ad either we are going to run some kind of uh, like if you walk into the uh, 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 some of the retail things like unilever or basically lot of uh, female centric products also they do like for cosmetics and all they give you like why you, uh, you can try out by lakme and all they do those kind of uh, uh, some in in mall area promotions right so the second part will also be the newspaper the facebook and different e-commerce platform where you are running different kind of an promotions and ideally like if you do too many things that is also doesn't help you you have to understand like which are the key drivers or key channels where ideally i should promote things and that will allow me to uh, gauge something as a um, in the beginning when srikant was mentioning right do we get a optimization tool and also what he intended to say is like because these parts will not be the cases as an optimization so supposedly if i am dropping my price from x percent so like now um, you have some price point of a product right you are say coke you are selling it coke 1.2 liter you are selling it at 40 rupees say now you say that i want to uh, give a discount of 5% on 40 now i'm selling on 40 i want to say i want to sell it at 38 or 37 so what is a potential increment in volume i am going to get so now this concept will be dependent on the elasticity as well so these are the component like when we talked about sales team incentive incentive they're talking about our price discounts so these are all the drivers so i am doing some advertisement Pardon. What is elasticity? Price elasticity and cross elasticity. Yeah, I'm coming to that. Yeah. Just I'm giving an example. I'm going to come down to that. So now this will be your drivers. So when we talked about like different, uh, there can be few things like during the time of a festival, right? Uh, in Mumbai during the Ganesh Chaturthi, you will see uh, the sales. will traditionally will pick up same thing in hyderabad at the at the occasions you will see the festivals will be uh, you know uh, your festive spend will be more same thing happens uh, in in the in the northern side when you see the diwali so diwali is something where your your sales are driven right so if not because of the fact that i am running a promotion i am seeing that impact if typically the festival which is uh, which is driving the at part so that is why the seasonality of the festivals do spend the time uh, uh, create a lot of importance so now your tv component sales team because these are typically data we are not going to have but we are going to have something data on the promotions which we are going to uh, we are going to take care here 
I'm giving you a, a base understanding on that. And next part is a loyalty program is basically suppose that you are giving some offerings to the customers. Uh, some uh, because there you're going to target some customers, right? That is a separate than the promotion. Promotion is something that you are running in store. So if you talk about this price discount, this price discount is nothing but if I have reduced my prices, what is the net increment incremental value I'm, I'm getting? So these promotions will be a short term component. So I'm going to run it for seven days, 10 days or 14 days. So that will be the tenure that I'm going to run for it. Right. But typically for loyalty program, out of your say, 10 million, you may be targeting 25, 25,000 customers and giving that, them that relevant category offers, right? If you buy anything in shampoo category for head and shoulders, you are going to get an offer of 15 or 20 percent. So this will come to a, a section of an customers uh, and that too within a validity of like 15 days. But price discounts are typically that are run over a set uh, over the stores for a month, for a 15 days, whatever that calendar may be. And that will keep on changing. It is not that the every product. So even you are promoting too much of a product, that is also not good. So you have to decide like, okay, I maybe need to promote this product for three to four times in a year. That is fair enough for me. So this is typically that uh, because this is uh, the decision that as an analyst, you also can't take. Uh, it's a lot depends on the supply chain operations and uh, definitely in terms of the if you have the promotion has got some cost right how much a supplier will fund to it how much a retailer will fund supposedly if you talk about l'oreal or head and shoulder both of them they want to run some promotions right but a retailer they will say that you know i can't afford to give 10 or 15 percent because how this typically works is like your suppliers say head and shoulder and l'oreal will uh, give the product to the will, will uh, the negotiation happens between a retailer and a supplier level uh, they said like for my this product this is the cost price at 20 or 25 right but the retailer is going to sell the 25 at a say, selling at 35 now the question is like how much discount that we can offer and who is going to fund that so retailer they expect a five or ten percent of uh, ten percent of your day he say is uh, saying this is the margin in the product right so if this is a margin of my product so then the negotiation happens like as uh, as Srikant mentioned the price elasticity uh, so what is price elasticity I'm coming to it uh, uh, you know to it now uh there's a model that we create this market mix model so we have to run at a product level even so what it does is like if i am offering the discount of like so elasticity is typically uh the change in volume with respect to change in price this is expressed in percentage so if i lower down the price of my product from 5% to 3% or 2%. So what is the expected percentage change in volume that we are expecting? So this is called elasticity. So this is called direct elasticity. So I know that my product I'm selling at say 35 rupees. And if I can lower down the price to or two percent is called point elasticity that a single point is going to determine so normally this is typically a, a elastic product will be uh, minus like it will be in negative so anything greater than your elasticity between zero to one if it comes is basically you your if you are changing your price point you don't see much change in your volume so in but greater than one is like even you can uh, change your prices because that is not going to give you incremental volume to it. So that is how the uh, price elasticity works. So normally the elasticity is basically whenever I am lowering the price, the change in price, I say the percentage change in the volume with respect to the percentage change in the price. So if I see if I from 35, if I am lowering down the volume to 32, 
I expect more customers to buy to that product, right? So if more customers are buying to that product, so that means there will be net increase in volume of the product. So at a 35 rupees, say I was selling 200 products, 200 units, my bad. Now from 35, if I'm lowering the price to 32, from 400, it has gone up to 600 or 700. So net incremental uh, volume will be nothing but 700 minus 400, that is say 300. So what is the cost now? From 35, I have lowered to 32. I have lost some percentage of my sales, but if that compensates through my additional volume, that is what always is going to uh, drive efficiency of this uh, price discount. So whenever we, uh, whenever a retail, why this concept of elasticity? So the retailer goes uh, to the supplier and says, say this is what uh, your current volume looks like. This is what the elasticity, I mean, uh, they will not exactly understand the elasticity component. They may, they may not, uh, because they have a different team like Unilever, uh, Johnson and Johnson, they have a good dedicated team. They do understand the technicalities, but in terms of if you talk about any local suppliers, uh, they might not understand. So, uh, so that's why you have to create some scenarios and say, okay, this is what your normal price is around. Now, um, at this price, we are getting this many units sold. But now, if I drop your prices from this to uh, say from X to uh, X minus uh, X minus two percent or five percent. So at this cost, we are expecting this will be the amount of volume that is going to be sold. If this is the amount of volume that is going to be sold, this means this many amount. This is a revenue. So from that margin, so which I'm getting minus three, as I said, like you're uh, you're decreasing your mar uh, margin, but because of the incremental volume, the net revenue has gone up. So this is the incremental revenue that is going to happen. And while doing that, as a supply chain. So the question that you had uh, three countries like in terms of uh, the availability of stock issues, basically when you run a promotion based on these estimated volume of sales over the time, your inventory management should be planned as well. So why promotion specifically? So why while creating these, uh, you know, out of time prediction, your promotion plays a vital role even. So getting it for getting an overhand, okay, this is the time that we are even running a promotion. It always helps to have the right inventory in or stock in place. So then this is component of elasticity. The cross size, uh, cross elasticity is basically uh, there's own price and cross price is basically this is further divided into two component of it. The one component that we talk uh, is basically based on the example of the complementary goods and second is the substitute goods. Supposedly, if I am buying shampoo, there, as you said, of the associated categories, complementary is nothing but associated that your conditioner, your did you see that shower gel, those body care, uh, uh, you know, categories, they can get influence, right? So, if my if my uh, if I am uh, giving a discount on baby, uh, sorry, if I'm getting, giving a discount on shampoo, that might lead to a, a, a conditioner. And if you see that as some sales will be get affected of the conditioner because someone trying to buy a shampoo may buy into the a conditioner, irrespective of that you are running any uh, promotions or not. So even that you're running a promotion, definitely the likeliness of getting sold will more in, uh, will increase, but even not that so big, basically, you have to take note of that. What the substitute, what it means is like, I know I'm running uh, while creating this model at a uh, at a product level, that is UPC level, UPC level you talk about. So if you are running a promotion on Coke 1.2 liter, that is uh, going to cannibalize the sales of Pepsi 1.2 liter. So if you add the volume of your Coke 1.2 liter will always be a function of its own price. That is Coke 1.2 liter and the price of my substitute and also the promotion. 
if my product like if cook's product is not in promotion but tipsy's product is that is going to impact the sales so while you create these own like cross price losses typically it's uh, you know you uh, it's a very computationally expensive while you create this kind of model you need 104 weeks of data that is two years of data you should have the seasonality you should have all the promotions data whenever at which store uh, which categories you had the promotions you have to map the promotion data and you have to create those flags okay for this week for this store for this category or SKU, it was offered on promotion and if you somewhere get the list of like if i talk about i'm doing it for some category it's a cold beverage i know the uh, for pepsi coke is your on coke and thumbs up is your immediate substitute right you put substitute one and substitute two like uh your uh say for coke you will do it for pepsi and thumbs up you put their store cross week wise price point for the thumbs up and uh thumbs up and uh say, say coke now any change in the price point of these two substitute will have a direct impact on your volume so what you're going to see that my percentage change my competitor change in uh, change in percentage price will leading to like uh, say if they are dropping their price your volume count going down so that is what the cross price elasticity is about so that is an extensive because a lot of some of the companies uh, they dedicatedly work on this so because there you need uh, like if it if i talk about a bcg or uh, mackenzie has a very good uh, pricing uh, pricing uh, algorithm to it so they have a, a very uh, good chunk of optimization the simulations that does so this is something you can do it in the modeling but if changes in the elasticity and uh, you know while you play down and you show your supplier like okay if you change it from uh, from 40 to 38 see this is a net incremental volume and this means this may this amount of revenue opportunity you know at this point of time this will be my for seasonality you are expecting this some base so what is the difference between base seasons and this all this is at a base period even you're not doing anything this is at least the quantity that gets sold but now because of seasonality or something you expect this will be the component if you are running a discount this is the component uh, of uh, of you uh, you know the component of sales that it goes because of that so you try to uh, this is called uh, from typically one we uh, once we uh, get this component we decompose to understand the what will be the different uh, you know where are the net benefits so from where we are getting the sales so that is what it's called of the um, if, if uh, like in terms of the price philosophy we talked about uh, the impact of competitors is basically if you know uh, if you have the data that in my competitor store or or my competitor is running this kind of a promotion so even coke uh, supposedly you have two stores nearby right so say reliance fresh and you have uh, say big bazaar both of them are very nearby some of them is running a promotion on coke one uh, coke um, but other one is not so that is also impact your volume so that is what all uh, these drivers will will be about so this is typically the example in terms of the the model that we're going to talk about uh, while while doing it um <coughs> so sales is a you know promotions competitors and all these components so while you're going to decompose this is a typical case of an market mix modeling that we are going to look into it and finally that was the way we are going to uh, end up is uh, looking into the forecasting model so basically now once you identify this so always there is a question like uh, what can be my expected uh, sales at a given point of time so to do that uh, there is something we are not uh, we we will run a time series modeling for that uh, we'll take one example here uh, that will be a rima model and uh, we are going to see how the forecasting uh, happens uh, to give you a, a bigger to give you a view on what i have seen uh, time series modeling does work well in terms of uh, the electronics world the manufacturing or uh, uh, you know manufacturing sectors there you can uh, there you can have a uh, there you can have a uh, there you can have a uh, more better accurate uh, accuracy 
but typically with the grocery with the definite changes in the in the category buying pattern the demographics and everything uh we have not seen a very decent uh, results coming on that but just in the course of the intent of the, uh, of these will be just to make you aware of the different techniques that are present in the market and which is just to touch base more on that so yeah that will be more on the uh you know the, the how the course uh, will be will be designed and different stuff that we are going to talk about Any questions so far on this? So I think guys, you have the uh, like you have the Jupyter notebook in your uh, in your system, so that that will be the requirement. So you should have uh, like some Python platform to run things. Uh, Rash, uh, Rashmi Srikant, uh, do you have that? Hello. Yeah, I don't have uh, Python installed in my machine, so I would like to have your assistance in this. Yeah, I think this is something, uh, you know, uh, Dexlab will take care of that. Uh, just you have to put that as a requirement, so they will do that. What about you, Rashmi? I have installed Python. Okay, cool. Uh, so this is if I. Uh, just give you an example about the kind of data sets that we have. If you see, this is a, um, let me show you, yeah. So here, this is a trans the typical transaction data that we are going to have. We are going to have data on the customer segments as well. Like this is the household key, say basket ID, what day, what product, what quantity, uh, what net discount they have got on these particular products. So we have those set of information. Uh, then which uh, week number if they have got any coupon uh, then it's more of like the coupon data this will be the transactional data that we are going to talk about and uh, next I'm going to show you a few of the data sets that we are going to use of in over here hey hi Shurajit can you please share these data sets to us also so that we can like try it out yeah, definitely. That will be there because once we start with the session, I think uh, you know Sh uh, Shubra is going to Shubra from the Excel. We're going to communicate more than that, so we will have those data sets. I'm going to uh, give it to you definitely. Sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there will be few of these data sets already. I've uh, kept it. What we are going to use, and uh, accordingly we'll proceed. I'm going to just. I had one data set so which I have. Uh, from just a sec. Yeah, if you see this part, uh, this will be your typically a product data is let me open it for you. So typically this will be a product ID, then you will have the which department brand uh, description, sub description. So at this level of data, we are going to use uh, in terms of the category and the department hierarchy is about. So this is more on the product side of the data. Uh, then we are going to use some demographic data, but uh, we'll see how much will restrict. So more of the age band, this is the household key that we are going to have. Um, and this is number of household. I think there will be household key. Yeah, this is a household key. We have some age descriptions, income, uh, you know, marital status. Uh, we'll have the kids category, we'll have or not. So those bits of demographic data that we're going to look into it. So I've, I've uh, shown you the product. I've shown you the uh, demographic data. The coupon data will typically look like which store or uh, which product was in there because this will all depend on the coupon redemption. So as, as we oh the last part I messed out uh, after the time series forecasting, we are also going to touch base more on the campaign analytics. So campaign analytics typically will talk about like uh, what are how we typically how this uh, in the retail world how this campaigns been conducted. Uh, 
how the retailer reach out to suppliers, how this negotiation, again, those will have to, that I've shown you, those discussions will do also happen there. And then typically, uh, I think there is some, yeah, uh, display mail or here. So whether you have sent a mail or coupon or whatever, so at, uh, at week, which week number, which store, which product ID, uh, uh so these are typically the data another this is our normal data in um just a sec so in there will be coupon we have two or three data which we need to you know uh, which coupon which product which campaign so all those information will be there and particularly uh, which customers have bought it description household key and what kind of campaign they have also taken so we have to you know merge multiple data to get an understanding of that uh, so basically uh, here what we are going to look into it how these campaigns are get uh, how these campaigns have been designed uh, in terms of uh, if you have to select some offers and then if you have to select the right candidates or right customers for that how we're going to do that so the first part will be identifying your target customers then post once you have done your uh, you know uh, your coupon so there will be a taste control matching right so when once you are doing a, a coupon you need to measure the impact of that so you if you see that i have 100k customers probably you will give 90k customers they're going to give them the coupon and 10k customers you will not give them the coupon right because you have to hold out as a measure like control we say like how my test group is doing and how my control group is doing. So this test and control customer selection will be happening at a pre-period. So pre-period means that initially we are going to select some eight weeks to 13 weeks of time frame where we are going to match these households based on their spin pattern, their segmentation. There can be some stratified sampling as well. So we will be doing some sampling exercise on that to decide if test and control. And out of that, we are going to say allocate some X percentage the coupon and so 90% will be the coupon say and 10% didn't have the coupon uh, stuff. So now post that event, you're going to have to measure the evaluation like based on how many participated, how many of them had redeemed that offer, what is the net uplift that you are getting. So these are will be the component that will design the uh, uh, overall evaluation of the campaign so that's there we are going to end up with a, a based on a campaign evaluation so the way we have tried to give a flavor is like starting from the customers what are the important things to understand how uh, based on your behavioral part their attributes uh bit in terms of customer retention then we moved on based on also we are going to work on the range recommendations and those parts of it like how we typically see in the uh, in the in-store how things been get uh, you know taken care of so what, what are those the associations uh, uh, on uh, your associations and different other uh, you know the metrics that we talked about in terms of that we should look into it uh, while in while designing the in store part of it next we are going to move also on the marketing part of it like how we typically see the price and the promotions or those work together in into the retailer those uh, the bits we are going to cover then see more on the of kind of on how forecasting helps and finally we'll go and understand on the campaign side of it so this in uh, in uh, you know if i talk about typically in a 360 degree view it will give you an enough understanding on this world uh, there are like if you talk about uh, this uh, because i think we try to capture more of the variation that happens in terms of advanced ml techniques that we have not like advanced ml techniques uh, if, I, if we talk about neural network and all that will be not been up uh, in the scope uh, uh it's basically uh, from the machine learning perspective because if you talk about factoring uh, the clustering these are already the part of of a ml techniques because if you talk about any sort of, uh, supervised or unsupervised learning techniques even uh, we do capture the factor, the recommendation engine. These are all the part of your uh, the ML components. So we have tried to add, uh, uh, added, add some part on on that as well, so that it gives a good flavor and makes it uh, it's also how we uh, you know take the ML application side into retail, but not in uh, fully like when you talk about the productive modeling, we'll do the logistic regression. But there are techniques like uh, Exiboost, like boosting and random forest and all, probably based on the time and based on what we see that probably i can showcase how it can be doable 
but uh, that is not actually the part of the scope and uh, uh, and lifetime value of as uh, Srikanth you mentioned the customer lifetime value is something that we are going to not uh, have uh, uh, in these codes that is not in the scope right now. Yeah. Anything, any questions, anything, any doubts or something? So I can take that. Do you give any project assistance for this? The data set we just talked about is a, is a real time, uh, you know, the, uh, the project data, it's a live data with some cascading of information. Yeah. So whatever we are going what to are do. What are the business use cases you are trying to deal here? The business case will be around, as I mentioned, like every of the exercise that we are going to touch base will be on an applied business case. It's not only that, you know, we talk about the techniques, but based on this real time data, we are going to get a case. Like whenever we are going to be doing a segmentation, the case will be understanding the buying behavior of our customers and create a homogeneous group, right? In the campaign, there will be a case like how you design your campaign, how you for particular some categories you're going to take and we are going to design those offers. So everything will be because we have enough data in order to formulate a business case and we are going to proceed because uh, definitely this data can be translated into a business case and we can uh, we can go around. Because whatever we are going to whatever we are going to talk, it will be based on business real time business problem itself so because that's why it is an okay. on life data and what we are because when we even are doing a predictive model so the obviously the question will be how you how you prevent customers to uh, churn right so what are the drivers of for churn so that will be the business question that we need to understand and address from this data So if you have any questions, I think uh, you can also reach out to Shubro so he can help you out, uh, uh, you know, answering those uh, cases that you, you that you need. So, but this is typically, you know, of the intent of the course is always to understand, engage the real time business problem and, and, and address through uh, using this data. Yeah. Rashmi, anything on your side? Oh. I'm good. Sure, Chief. These Python things will run on PySpark shell also, no? Pardon? Can you come in, please? I was saying that the, these Python things, that these algorithms and all those that you will be telling us, that will run on PySpark shell also, no? Uh, PySpark sale because uh, I'll give you an example because I run uh, this will be running on PySpark sale uh, absolutely but uh, you know uh, the difference is on like in terms of coding also if you are aware like PySpark and Python will be different right uh, because there you're going to use more of like uh, the, uh, the example like you do dot with column to create something yeah. so here in uh, Python it will be different so. I normally I work in PySpark environment, but actually my official things I work on PySpark. But uh, here I am I do because if you have same environment PySpark installed, it should work. So if you have any questions like how this can be done in PySpark, I can definitely because some of the things definitely which uh, you know uh, we would have in PySpark order. I can tell that. Yeah, like reading and analyzing the data thing that everything can be done in PySpark that I know. But like the clustering and then algorithms you apply in for yeah, these ML algorithms. That will work in PySpark or not that I want to know. Now if we, because since you will be using a PySpark shell, it, the, the Python will also run on that. And uh, so because we are going to, uh, we are going to, the coding will be in the Python, but it will be it can be run through in the PySpark shell. Uh, typically, uh, uh, you know, if I talk about the PySpark environment, uh, K-means and a couple of uh, logistics also, they have their own, um, uh, it got their own set of codes that I know. So, but uh, typically we're going to uh, run through the codes in Python notebook, but uh, Python codes, 
but it will because if you're running on five bucks shell it, uh, it, it it will run so it will not have an issue on that but okay. if you are talking about the scripts PySpark versus python we are going to do it in python okay probably uh, during like later part of the you know the session uh, i can share out uh, the, what kind of the potential uh, like recommendation engine so what, what i was discussing so we use something called alternative git but so that works in PySpark. that doesn't work on python so in likewise came in clustering we do have a code in PySpark. so that is something that i can share that with you uh, but just you have to try at your end yeah sure Actually, I won't try like the thing that we are doing in Python and PySpark also. Like if we are doing this analysis and analytics on a larger set of data, then we usually go with PySpark. PySpark, absolutely. Because uh, I work typically on the retail data, I work on PySpark. So for the modeling, because what happens, uh, PySpark doesn't have all the functionalities uh, that we typically see in the ML platforms, like market mix modeling and all that doesn't have it. So in that case, we we have to translate back into the into the Python. So that is one of the challenges because it doesn't have all the functionality and algorithm placed in PySpark. Okay. Cool. Any more questions? But, but there must be something like if we haven't in PySpark, like since we are doing ML with Py in Python, so there must be some techniques uh, just uh, like and then. Of that, yeah, like, there, are, uh, there are some techniques available, but the problem is like, uh, you know, it's not an uh, the PICE work has evolved over the time. So, but they, the, for the email perspective, they don't have all the techniques uh, that that we have in, in Python. But okay. some of like clustering, K-means clustering, it has got, uh, it has got logistic regression. Uh, because okay. since all big, these are something that I've applied in Python, so I have to also see that how PySpark can be configured. But uh, even like due to due course of time, we will see that uh, like if I have some material which I can share with you, so definitely we can give it a try. Yeah, sure. For k-means clustering and all, yeah, I do have uh, factoring. I do have so definitely I'll uh, I can at some point I will definitely give it to you. Yeah. Sure. So in terms of the further, you know, the classes and everything, I think Shubhro from the X-Levels will communicate with you. Uh, I think it will be important that I'm going to share these data sets and you start uh, with the, because since you are aware of the Python perspective, right? The joining the data sets, the merging the data sets, uh, doing bit, uh, uh, you know, the, some of the statistical parts, uh, taking some KPIs, you can start with that. So that will give you a bit of the hands-on on the, on the data. So uh, that is something that I'm also, you know, that would be helpful that we can proceed a bit faster on that. And the second thing, like, uh, are you aware on the, like, the class and the module, or like if you have to create classes and also, Rashmi, do you, uh, are you comfortable on that? Yeah. So in classes Python. module in Python. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So class modules and uh, functions and all, you're, uh, you're very familiar, right? Yeah yes perfect perfect yeah that works okay i think that's also with, from, yeah good. Actually, okay, i'm just cool. not familiar with these uh, statistical techniques and these algorithms i haven't used them actually so yeah, perfect, perfect. Do, i have implemented almost all things so that those things i know okay okay cool 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 that, that's awesome um so that's all from my side today and uh, uh so anything more or so we should go for today yeah oh, that's it Suraj. thank you thanks from my end thank yeah. okay thank you see you in the next class thanks so much. yeah please expect a communication coming from shubra okay yeah, sure. all right thank you okay. thank you, okay, thank you. Bye. bye Thank mm -hmm. you.